Hello, everybody listening at home. You're very welcome along to episode 22 of the Football Pod with Paddy Andrews and Andy Moran. Don't know where to start this week. It's been a busy couple of days in the GA. You had Kerry uh, and Peter Keane releasing that statement on Friday night, unprecedented, you might say. You had Kildare Football getting their act together, uh, pointing Glenn Ryan on his dream ticket with Anthony Rainbow and Johnny Doyle and Dermot Early. There's plenty of club action as well. Um, Conor McKenna is joining us today. Paddy Andrews, so I'm really looking forward to that. But I suppose we'll start off where we always start. Any news this week? <laughs> Andy, do you matter now? Nothing. That's a leading question, Tomas. Uh, <laughs> what, what did they say? I'll plead the fifth. Is that what they say? <laughs> All I wanted to know is how much mileage could you claim coming from Dublin 15 to Carrick and Shannon? <laughs> As if let, leads from need a water boy, I I'm putting my I'm throwing my name in the hat for that. Just let's 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 not be cryptic here, lads. Um, our WhatsApp group was very very quiet last week, and rumors started emerging. Are they only rumors at the minute, Andy Bourne, or are you the new boss of Leitrim Football? No, they're most certainly only rumors as of uh, as of now. But um, yeah, listen, I was the, I was the land for manager three weeks ago. I'm the Leitrim manager now, so. <laughs> I blame Paddy Andrews. I blame Paddy. The contract. That's <laughs> all. Paddy, Paddy was trying to get me down to Clarity, so it's uh, yeah. No, listen, it's uh, yeah. It's it's an interesting it's an interesting time, but it's uh, it's good, and uh, hopefully in the next couple of days we'll be sorted. I'm holding out now. That's oh, wow. Jeez, Kerry would have been great for this stuff. Imagine the golf we could have played in Clarity next summer. Like <laughs> you as the head man, Jenny as the backs coach, myself as the water boy, playing golf four days a week. Jacko just pipped us through. He just got there in front of us, didn't he? Uh, it's not what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> now, what would you be like with the mileage, Paddy? Would you be you'd be fairly good at clocking it up, going cross country? Mileage in his life. I suppose he didn't, did he? I'm new to the game. I bet you don't even know how much you get, do you? His expenses was the toll bridge. He only had the toll over and back. That's everything. It's expensive that toll. How far is it? Leach up to Dublin's what? Fifty minute drive, is it? Oh, it's more than that. It's a wee bit more. I'll, I'll put it in Castleknock to, to Carrick and Shannon. An hour. If it's at over an hour, I don't know if I can commit, yeah. even for you, Andy. Cross it to Shannon for a media gig or a wedding. That's all he does. That's all he comes out. Oh. He- Heller's kind of... sail there. Get me a yacht in uh, Carrick and Shannon Harbour there. Yeah? <laughs> well, do you know what? Um, as long as Paddy Andrews gets the exclusive first interview with Andy Moore, and wherever you end up going, I don't mind. I'm happy enough with that. So we'll move on from that. Interesting times in the world of Gaelic football. Special Congress is around the corner, lads. We're going to do a bit on that next week. We're going to talk about it. We've been doing loads on off the ball over the last couple of weeks. We've had Tony McEntee on the show. Podge Collins has been on the show. Brian McAvoy, the Ulster Council Secretary, has joined the show this morning. He's he's against um, any change coming into play next year. We know that a lot of the players are for change. So it's a massive year ahead um, and a massive decision ahead in the next two weeks. Can I ask you just why, just why he's against it? Just as uh... But Brian McAvoy is one of the obviously four provincial uh, secretaries in the in the country. You've won in Ulster, you've won in Munster, John Prenty and Connacht, and uh, one in Leinster as well. And uh, McAvoy is against it for a number of reasons. He described it as one of the worst proposals ever put forward to Congress, which <laughs> I think is pretty harsh, seeing as Congress voted through to ban joint can- captains lifting the trophy last year, which I think a lot of people agree was possibly the biggest waste of time we've ever seen at Congress. Um, He's against it for a couple of reasons. One of the reasons is that there's a complicated, convoluted way with Proposal B that if you get relegated from Division 3, yet you win the Talchon Cup, you stay up and somebody else gets relegated. That, to me, is the only possible slight against Proposal B. But I think we're going to get into it more in in depth next week because I know Paddy has a lot to say about it. And uh, we'll we'll properly wait for that next week and and properly get into it. Um, This week... Paddy, I know you had your eye on the Kildare ticket that were appointed. Yeah, are, you, yeah. are you rattled in Dublin? Glenn Ryan's back. Anthony Rainbow's been involved in Dublin club football. Johnny Doyle's a fellow you would have come across a wee bit over the yeah. last wee while. Yeah, I, look, I think it's absolutely, I think it's a brilliant appointment for Kildare. If you are a Kildare GA supporter, if you're a young player in Kildare, you are excited about this. Like You've got four of, arguably, their four biggest legends Coming together, I had the pleasure of doing a bit of work with Johnny Doyle with my club in St. Bridget's. Would have played against him when I was starting out and he was coming towards the end. Would have massive respect for him and just a 
the grey fella as well, Anthony Rainbow's done a brilliant job with Bally Bowden winning the Dublin Championship up here uh, as well and, 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 and competing with the likes of Kill McCord and Bally Munn and things like that as well. Glenn Ryan has obviously had success underage with Kildare as well. And then Dermot Early, like, <laughs> Dermot Early is just a legend. <laughs> like, if you're a young player in Kildare, you are going to those training sessions. You just want to impress these guys. And if you look at the change from three weeks ago, where Jack O'Connor, rightly or wrongly, basically didn't really want to manage Kildare. He got the opportunity, basically just the opportunity to go and manage Kerry. And that's that's Jack was from there. That's where his passion lies. He's not going to have the same passion as, as, as what those four guys who were born and bred and have lived and played for Kildare for their whole lives. So Jack leaves. Kildare, people are annoyed at how that transpired. They're annoyed that they feel, you know, they've got to Division 1, they've got to Rennes to the final, they were showing signs of progress. And all of a sudden, these four guys come in where you know they are going to leave no stone unturned. So passionate about Kildare GAA. And like I say, just four of arguably their biggest legends to, to come back and, and try and get Kildare competing in Division 1 and competing to win championships again. So I think that the buzz and the atmosphere around that county are, 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 is surely high on the back of that. I, I think it's a great appointment for them. Um, but they're up against it, going into Division 1. Mm. I think Jack, to be fair to him, there was progress with him, despite everything else and how it's finished. You can't forget that. Getting Kildare to Division 1 and taking out Mead in that game at Newbridge and getting to an all Ireland, uh, or getting to a Leinster final and winning a couple of Champions games. That was progress. But those four guys, they're going to be up against it. But they are going to bring the fight. Um, so I think it's a great appointment for Kildare. Very, very exciting for them and for all their supporters. And I think if you're if you're a player there, Tommy, it's 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 like you you look at like if if I was a young fella, the two guys from Kildare I used to love watching were mm. Anthony Rainbow and Johnny Doyle, would you believe? So the wing back and the kind of forward connection. So if you're a young player, you've nearly covered every area of the pitch. You've, 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 <laughs> On it. You know, Lacey joined me today as well, and it just it's um, yeah, I think it's, it's really exciting. And I think the key thing about having someone within your county of a big county like Kildare or Kerry or so, or even uh, Mayo or Dublin is that yeah. you know the personalities of each area. So if you look at Mayo, for example, you have south, east, west, and north. Like the, a Ballina person is a lot different than a Claire Morris person, or Cal, you know, they're all kind of different. You know that, uh, uh, Paddy in Dublin, even like Northsiders and Southsiders. That's a whole other debate. <laughs> you know, even, even like our town, Balladrine, is a funny little town. Like it's uh, you're 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 a border town. You're born in three counties. You know, you always kind of feel like a bit of an outsider. You know, you, like you have a bit of a chip on your shoulder straight away before you start. And like for managers, they, they'll know that personality within the county, and I think that's important as well. And have you seen managers who have tapped into that in a good way and managers who have failed to manage that kind of, that chip on the shoulder that comes from a place like Balladrine? Oh, yeah, I think it's, uh, I think there's, there's, there's numerous, like I, I think the Dublin example would be would be the nearly the best example of Jim Gavin got the, the best out of certain areas. Individuals. Like if you look at what Pat Gilroy did with Michael Darren McCauley, for example. Mm. Uh, I remember watching Michael Darren McCauley, for, for example, in Hollymount in a challenge match when Pat Gilroy first came in and I didn't think those, Joe, you know, I didn't think he was going to make what he made as a footballer. Do you know, I thought he was, he was going to, like he was loose in his skills, wasn't he? He was a basketball player and nearly played yeah, Gaelic yeah, yeah, yeah. with yeah. lots of aggression. And then all of a sudden they just use his personality to their advantage and move on. Uh, in, in Mayo, there's numerous different examples, particularly around the Ballina. Ballina people are a tiny bit different. They're you know, mad into the basketball. They're a bit, you know, they'd be nearly American Americans in, in Mayo. Like they, they were into coffee, <laughs> they were into coffee and shorts before the rest. Better headline there. Yeah, you're yeah. just you're just describing Liam McHale there. Yeah, I mean, they're kind of all kind of like you know, they wouldn't all miss too much different than Liam McHale, you know. And they're all just kind of cooler characters. So you have to treat them a tiny bit differently as well. There's a lot to be said about generating a buzz in the county in the off season. Like Calair, like the people at Calair would have felt let down, I think, a little bit by Jack O'Connor maybe stepping away. And and now while well, you couldn't blame him, Jacko, Jacko must have got a nudge or he must have got a nod that there was something uh. brewing down in Kerry because he stepped back from a job that he had committed to keeping three weeks before that. Um to I suppose return back home to as he described it, and I don't know how accurate a description it was. But the Manchester United of, of Gaelic football jobs, the, the Kerry but, football jobs. Tommy, to be fair, in his defence, that's where his passion is. Mm. He's from Kerry. He, he's been there with him before. That's where his 
no matter what, and this is not just for Jacko, for anyone managing your own county and, and doing it for your own county is, is the pinnacle. Of course it is. Um, how it was handled, probably, look, I, we, there's no doubt about it because there people mm-hmm. were, were annoyed. And I think the wider GA community were looking at those comments and just thinking probably not the most subtle way to go about it. But Jacko, obviously, since I've got the well, opportunity to go back here with this, the, this the information. Players, the information we've got on off the ball is that there, there was a, there could have been a nod and a wink that the job was there if he wanted. Like, yeah, he said it the, literally the day we stepped down. We were on the WhatsApp straight away, going, mm. "He's obviously got the Kerry job because he had committed to stay with Kildare." Yeah. And all of a sudden, a U-turn of epic proportions. Obviously, there was something teed up. Now, whether all the stars aligned, denying it or pretending there wasn't. Look, whatever. yeah. And, and in fairness, for, for fairness all he, he went in and he. Won all Ireland in the early early noughties. Oh won yeah, won in the late noughties, but he didn't go away. That's he, he, like no. he, he didn't drop away. He went back into the minors. Won a couple all Ireland. Won two. Did, yeah, went into the twenty ones. Joe, so he was lining up to go back into the senior sub so, mm. job. So that was his that was his route. Yeah. And the, as as they say, all the stars aligned. Whatever happened in the background mm. went on. But Paddy's a hundred percent that Kerry football, the Jack O'Connor's passion, and you're on about back to the wall, chip on the shoulder stuff. Joe, he, he is that in abundance and he will go in there and he use everything in his power to get that team over the line. 100%. Yeah, very exciting developments in a couple of counties around the country. And just on Brian McAvoy, as I mentioned earlier on, the full interview is available in the OTB GA stream where you can listen to this podcast as well. But one of McAvoy's other issues is that the Provincials will be used as a pre-season tournament, I suppose, to replace the league. And then the league becomes a championship. Um, look at... Lads, it, it could give us 126 quality intercounty games next summer. A Gaelic football could be the biggest sport in the country. I was nearly going to say the world. In the country, if Proposal B comes true. And I think the more it's been talked about and the more it's been spoken about, hopefully the more people will see the, the light with that one. Um, there was a bit of talk last week that Proposal A should just be dropped altogether because there's nothing really to it. People aren't really for it and it's only going to water down the vote. And it'd be great to see a vote in Congress on the 23rd. A stick with what we have, which is knockout football, or B, vote in change and something different. So um, we'll see what happens. I, I, I'm i probably kind of speaking at the minute because I don't want you to give away all of your thoughts before next week because I'm hoping we'll do it all next week on, on episode 23 of the Football Pod. So Conor McKenna is coming up. I'm excited for this. I think he was christened the moments man on the podcast this year. Um, Paddy, is there anything in particular you're looking looking to learn off Conor McKenna here? I... I'm intrigued to, like I say, I, I, I don't know him. Uh, I wouldn't have played against him. He's kind of, I was finishing up as, as he was coming on, back on the scene with, with Tyrone. I think it's it's quite a unique, well, maybe not totally unique, but it's a very interesting story to, to, to go down, to be kind of an underage star, leave and go down to Australia and, and actually make the breakthrough. Like there's players who've gone and it just hasn't worked for them to come back quite soon. There's players mm. who've gone. It's been a huge success story. Or Zach Tui and Ty Canelli, obviously the most famous example of it. But he had the opportunity to, to hang on. And I'd say it was a massive decision to go in the first place. And then a massive decision to come back when he did. It's been absolutely justified, I'm sure. <laughs> Look, he's back two years and, and, and sitting here as an honor and a champion. So I'm just interested in the dynamic of how he came to those decisions and the experience of it. And... I'm sure, well, I don't, I'm sure he'll tell us, you know, I'd say he'll have no regrets about coming home with what's gone on over the last, what happened three weeks ago and winning the All-Ireland. And also, we've touched on it, we spoke about him so much in the pod this, this season. Where does he feel his best position is? We don't know. We're kind of, is he a forward? Is he midfield? Is he better coming from deep? I'm in, intrigued to see what he thinks himself. So, uh, look, I, I think it's, he'd be a great guest. Um, he might give us a bit of insight what was the crack like after the All Ireland? Always interested to hear about that. <laughs> was it a good week? I'd say it was a great week. So uh, yeah, just th- those couple of things, and it'd be very interesting to hear his side of things on that. All right, looking forward to getting into it. Stay tuned. This is episode twenty-two of the Football Pod with Paddy and Andy. We're going to be back right after this with Tyrone's All Ireland winner Connor McKenna. Welcome back to episode 22 of the Football Pod of Paddy and Andy. It's taken 22 weeks, but finally we have our first big guest. I'm not counting Roddy Collins from last week. Connor McKenna, Tyrone All-Ireland winner is with us. Connor, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, lads. 
I'm just going to jump off here. I know Paddy and Andy, they both like to talk, so they'll probably take over this interview in the next couple of minutes. But uh, the first question I wanted to throw at you, Connor. In 2018, you said, I would love to come home at some stage and win an All-Ireland. Hopefully, I will still be young enough to do it when I come home. How, does it, how did it feel to fulfill that prophecy in September? Hey, still not, not a shock, but just like probably surreal. I think I remember, I remember watching the main or the Ireland final in 2018 and thinking it would probably still be in Australia for another two or three years at least. And then I remember saying that actually. And now to be home 12 months later having Ireland, it's, it's just surreal. Like it, you don't think it's going to happen that quick as we're talking about. It could take by 12 years and some ways, unfortunately, never see it. It is just a bit of luck sometimes. And I think I just got the, the lucky side that I came home at the right time. Watching you play football, it, it kind of it's always struck me that nothing really seems to phase you on a football pitch. But when you when Kilpatrick feels that ball in the 65th minute and he flicks it to you and you drive through on goal, you're like, I'd say one of your old fellas, Greyhounds, tearing through Crow Park there. And you flick that past to Canavan or to, yeah. like, oh, I said it was Canavan today, to McCurry and he buries it. There's an image of you smashing the ground with your fist in celebration. I don't know if you remember it, but did anything go through your head at that moment? Was that you saying... Right. This that was me it. saying it's the first time he puts the ball in the fine and thank God I did something half decent <laughs> with it. So, no, nah, just probably relief. Like, I, I know I didn't have a great year, but that when I get the ball, I can hopefully do something with it. So I was probably just a bit of frustration going right in the ground, but thank you in the back of the net. The fact that you say, Connor, sorry, uh, putting in there, but the fact that you say you didn't have a great year, we, we, we had you on our team the year last week or two weeks ago. Um, is that frustration because, like, when you're in the AFL, you're thinking about possessions and you're thinking about getting on the ball and you're all stats? And would you, like, do you get frustrated when you're not getting on the ball playing Gaelic football? Or where's that frustration coming from? It's not, I'm sorry, I wouldn't say frustration. It's just I knew it wasn't a great year. I was very inconsistent. Uh, I did I was good periods during games, but I never really played a good game throughout the year. Like, I think in the AFL, I hated the fact that the games were solely counting how you played and how many touches you got. So I got a midfielders especially got the ball maybe 30 to 40 times a game. But 80% of the time they were just kicking over the head. And I used to hate it because players were solely more or less valuing how many touches they got in the game, which yeah. it doesn't correlate to how good you are, how effective you can. You can touch a ball four times a game and be far more effective than touching the ball 30 times a game and not doing anything with it. Yeah. So it's something I really disliked this really, that it was something they valued so much. Where, where did... That's, that's what we said about, uh, I suppose, about you was, yes, you, your possessions were lower probably than you'd like to be. You'd like to be doing different stuff in the game, but your two goals against Kerry, you know, like there were huge moments. Of course, you want to play a tiny bit better in around the fringes and getting a more ball and stuff like that. But there are huge moments within the game and it's something that Tyrone have probably struggled with over the course of the last couple of years of scoring goals, even coming into that Kerry game. Do you spot them moments? Do you, do, you, do you see them moments like we see your eyes when you're flicking the ball onto to Matty Donnelly against Monaghan? Do you spot them moments in game or is it just an instinctive thing that happens with you? Probably more instinctive. Like I, I think Tommy said there, nothing, not that I had really phased me, but even if I'm playing bad at the end of the game for me, it's just a game of football. It doesn't affect me that much. Like if I'm playing bad in the game, it doesn't really bother me, to be honest. So I go through the game without touching the ball for 60 minutes, but know if I get the ball that I can do something half decent with it if I, if I do get it. So it really doesn't bother me. But as you say, it's just when I get the ball, making an impact. You were speaking to a colleague of mine, Connor, last year when you came home. And when you come home, you bloody exploded onto the scene in the league last year. And like, I think we were all starving for football. It was, you know, pandemic, had, we were in the middle of it. You were home a month. Mickey Hart puts you in centre forward against Donegal. You're smashing into Michael Murphy. The, you know, it, it was unbelievable. And then you're out and you have that kick pass to Dara Canavan for the goal. And I think people started going, right, this lad is here. And I think you were involved in a buddy of mine, Eamon Dunn, who had a stats column in the Irish Times, 5'10" out of 527 that Tyrone had scored. You were directly involved in either scoring it or assisting it. And I remember you being on with Owen Sheehan, a colleague of mine that week, and you said, I don't see the point of playing a game if you don't take risks. Now, there isn't, I, like, Paddy, Andy, I'm not sure from your playing careers, was there many footballers who, who acted like that to take risks? Where did you get that from, Connor? Oh, Jesus, I don't know. I just, I think back to the point where if I do mess up or do something stupid, doesn't really bother me like I don't really care like it's 
you're out there to enjoy the game is the number one thing. If you win, <clears throat> it's just a bonus like. So I think doing the, the same, uh, probably I missed the pair football of Gaelic football, but it was very defensive and probably not a bad time for me to actually go to Australia and play AFL because it sort of did a full loop going back to more structured and back to the way I liked it. So I think I just grew up like that, sort of just taking risk and I know in AFL I got a couple of scholars for it, like doing stuff that I probably shouldn't be doing, but it's just a certain enjoyment but I probably get out of it. Connor, we're touching on it and we were speaking about it. You're talking there, even identified yourself. You had some maybe quiet periods and games, but then th- those moments come along for you. And there's no two ways about it that there were some massive plays that you made this year that, that ultimately were the difference in some of the biggest games. Look at the, the, the semi final and, and the pass, the brilliant pass for, for Darren's goal in the final. Do you feel like, and we're kind of struggling, where do you feel is your best position? Do, do, like, or do you know? Because <laughs> we, we, is that like if you, there's so much talent there, and that's what we're kind of saying. And you know yourself, you know, there's definitely more in you. And is it a case that do I play with midfield suit you? Where you're going to get more, where you are going to get more possessions, or do you hold out and stay, play close to goal with, with, with Maddie and Darren? And then you're not going to get as many possessions, but you're, you're close to goal. And when you get it, you can make a massive difference. or what do you see, uh, ideally? Or yeah, it's probably still something I'm struggling with. Like I'm back in the club now, and I'm sort of probably doing the same, going between midfield and full forward. But I did struggle last year, probably this year as well, with the fitness out of it. A really? AFL people used to say to me, "Oh, you come on, you be flat fit." But AFL, I could go for five or six minutes flat out, knowing that I would get a two minute break, yeah. or every so often the ball would go out over the sideline, and you get you nearly get thirty seconds of a slow walk or a walk or a slow jog. Whereas gig football, you score a goal, you run the pitch, you score a goal, the ball's on the cone and go back of your head. I really did struggle with that this year and last year. And it's something that probably Me and Andy struggled with that for a whole career. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> so uh, Andy, that probably is something that I need to get better at. And I did have a bit of a grind niggle this year, so that's why I missed the Calvin game to start of the season and sort of struggled with doing full training loads. So I probably never really got enough time to lay like, Build my fitness up, so I probably do need a good pre-season of just running, which is probably not one of my favorite things to do. But to get that structure and a bit more fitness, probably will put my long way to going better. I think. Andy, you had picked that out, I suppose, halfway through the season. You had actually said it about Connor that you could you could recognize that in his game that there was these bursts of five or six minutes where he was having big impacts. Yeah, it's just like my I suppose my knowledge of it comes from. Pierce, Sandy and Keane who were from my club Connor. so yeah. just, I could kind of see what was happening within and I, I watched an awful lot of them guys playing for Brisbane when they were there and just you could see them playing for five minutes going off you know, dying for two mm. minutes back yeah. on and you, you could kind of see it within the game but yeah it was just uh, yeah it was just something we identified during the year but like I, I just think that that that's um, I wouldn't call it recklessness but your your like your abandonment Probably, I know you said that the game probably suited you coming back and in between it was a bit defensive. But that recklessness kind of, when you look at Tyrone now over the course of the, the Monaghan game, the Kerry game and the Mayo game, you can see how you helped that. Um, obviously, you had Morgan who could kick a bomb and you had Kilpatrick and Kennedy in the middle of the field who could flick ball on and stuff like that. But you were always willing to go beyond the runner. Um, was that something... Joe, you took an awful lot of the set plays for Essendon, I'm right in saying, didn't you, the restarts? Yeah, 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 chickens, yeah. So was that something that you worked on with, with the keepers, with, with Kennedy, with Kilpatrick over the course of the year, or was it just something that you kind of, is, is that just something you see, or did you, was that a training ground kind of play? Hey, we had, I remember talking to Peter Donnelly actually about it a couple of times that in Gaelic football, they love to, if it's not 100% play, not really as a keeper, kicking it out, but... In the AFL, when I was kicking the ball out, if we would sort of set up like a, a tall forward and a small forward, as we call it, and put the two together and sort of pull everybody one side, and if you get a, a 3v2 in it, that's a, that's a win-win situation, so kick it to that. So probably just not getting down the line of, if it's not 100%, don't do it. If it's 65 70%, take the risk and, and go for it, sort of not. Mm. I think you look at a lot of times there was, unless it's 100%, do not do it. Go back to your keeper, go short do the safe option, which for seven years, teams did against Dublin, it just didn't work. That's yeah. for sure. Great point. Yeah. I think, like, Morgan came on, to be fair, talking about 
he was challenged on the stats. I think it was the Kerry game, the semi final, where he yeah. came in and people are going, Jesus, kick out percentages are are low, like. And he's like, well, sure, that's that was the plan. Mm. And, and to be fair, like we were we're probably a big part of what we did with Dublin with, with Steve, and it was all retain the ball, let's keep the ball and move. That was our style, whereas Niall's thing is a little bit different. And and, and people were judging him probably through a lens that he's going, Well, that we are taking more risks. And, and I, I thought from day one this season, Connor, and you obviously maybe are, I think are perfectly placed to discuss this. Like the challenge w- w- with Tyrone probably towards the end of, of Mickey's reign, as, as brilliant as Mickey had been, like an icon and success he brought, there was a sense from the media, from ex-players in Tyrone and some grumblings that, that maybe Tyrone weren't going to be able to, to win the All-Ireland unless they let the shackles off a little bit. For, from our perspective with Dublin, we felt it, if you played defensively against us, we'd beat you. That, that, that's our point. We felt we were comfortable enough on the ball and that you wouldn't be able to hurt us enough um, because you didn't take enough risks. And, and Fergal and, and Brian come in this year. And to be fair, it's just an incredible job with, with the COVID situation and, and not having a whole pile of time to implement changes in the game plan. But you could definitely sense through the National League that there was a, a bit of a shift to, to a more offensive style of play that obviously suits someone like you as well. You had a year, you had Mickey's last year and then this year. Was there much of a difference? How, how much was this spoken about, Connor? Or I don't know if you can say or not, but you, you know, we're all friends here, so you won't say anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I suppose for me with Mickey, I only probably got the last two or three months of his throne career and it was also during COVID, so we only train twice a week, which is the normal case, you can train probably a lot more. But mm. I definitely remember noticing when it was, came home last year, because if, if you go to club throne club jobs up here, it is one of the best championships you to watch. The football is played is just unbelievable. And I remember watching it and it looked like boys were really afraid to maybe make a mistake. I remember, I think I actually could have said it one day in training that boys were really afraid to shoot because if they missed, it was like, fuck, I might be taken off or I might be scalded more. Now, I don't know if that was happening or that's just what I, I that's what I seen. And this year, you could just see a difference that a new lease of life. The players, maybe they're around the fringes. Like, I suppose Darren McRae is probably the perfect example where we all knew and told him how good of a he was, whether he wasn't used right or he just clicked this year. I'm not sure, but he just seemed to have a feeling this year that he's probably the one player of the team that if he got the ball anywhere to the 45, I'd be happy for him to shoot if he misses yeah. giving the ball a game because he, for a player like that, you just can't take it away from him. And it was definitely something that was last year that boys were sort of afraid to... They're always going back with a hand pass or a cross with a hand pass to the 100% option, as I'm talking about, instead of a 60 40 to the full forward line. So you could definitely see a shift in that, probably just a new lease of life for boys, especially they're around the fringes going, fuck, I have, a, I have a good chance of either getting a jersey or getting a jersey in 26. Like, our 26 this year changed that much. You, you honestly didn't know who was going to be on. Like, and I remember the night before the Iron Fight when the team was named, it was, it was just heartbreaking for some of the boys because they were on it all year and then. Yeah. They really were going with boys were training well, they were getting an opportunity to be on the bench. It was and it I suppose it's it's tough in one way, but it gives boys a sense of belief that if I'm not on one week, I could be on a two weeks. There, there was times it was changed by three or four men. It was just it was unbelievable. I I can't remember it now, but on the match day programme for the All Ireland final, you, you said two boys named at twenty six. And I can't remember who it was to make the cut, but you, the programme itself was the, I don't think they yeah, managed it was Connor to Connor Shields and Corporate Row. And they couldn't I suppose they couldn't decide who they were gonna pick on the day. And it was, I, I was it Monroe that, that ended up? Yeah, no, it was uh, Connor Shields actually. Was it? Okay. The problem, yeah. But it was just, yeah. it just, it was, I think it, if the, some of the training sessions were just really killing matches, like, but yeah, it was just, it was unbelievable. You, you didn't know who was going to be, be picked, like, and obviously harsh for some ways the way it goes out, but it just, it, the Fergal and Brian give everyone a chance. But it's, 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 it's the only way. Honestly, and Andy, you touched on about like success leaves clues and things like that. You heard of obviously this the famous Kilkenny stories with, with Brian Cody and success they had. That literally, no matter who you were, you have a training match on a Saturday the week before the game, and if you're not at the races, forget about it. And, and, and we had it. It was our our greatest strength with Dublin. I remember being in the team and having a howler in a training game and just being dropped, not even getting minutes the following week, and then the other way around. Yeah, because and it's. It just exactly what you're saying, Connor. It just keeps every every time you're out on the pitch, 
you're at it because you have to be. And that's, you, there's no, there's no days off. There's no taking it handy. And it's just, it's nearly bred into you. That's how you play in the games then. And you could see it, the, the intensity you guys played at. I felt it's got better with every game. I, I thought, thought from the Dash League finished in Killarney, which was a bit of a, bit of a, a nightmare how that game ended, but it was only a league game. And then you went from, from Cavan, got better against Donegal. Really tough game against Monaghan, and then your semi final and final performances were, were, were top of the pops as well. And you could just see that everyone coming in off the bench, there was just impact all the time. And it's, it was the exact same story with the success that we had. You had to train well, or else you're no use. Someone else is just going to uh, do it instead. Or, like, without our bench this year, we wouldn't have probably passed the second or third round. Like, it literally was. It was, I think, Michael Neal's a prime example. He plays center forward for us. Hmm. He probably doesn't get the recognition he deserves, but he's an absolute workhorse and he works for 45, 50 minutes every game, knowing he's probably going to take it off. But the boys that come on and finish the game is the boys that win the game. And it's just, there's some boys that don't get recognised for what they do, but to put in an unbelievable shift for 50 minutes, knowing they're going to come off and the next player comes on and they're, they're happy to do their job for that. How, how did you feel when you were on the pitch, Connor? And you're saying, you mentioned earlier on that you're frustrated, that you're, you didn't get to play your best football since you've come home. Like, <clears throat> there was moments, I think, in the semi-final where you're looking at the Tyrone bench and you're seeing McShane's there and Canavan's there and you're looking at Darren McCurry and Tom Sullivan had a great half on him and you're thinking, McCurry might get whipped here. He might get taken off, but he didn't. And he had a massive last 20 minutes. Likewise, in your, in your All-Ireland final, I suppose you had a quiet All-Ireland final. Were you looking over your shoulder or had Fergal Logan and Breyer Dewar given you, I suppose, the backing and the license to know that? We're going to back you in and switch it on when you can switch it on. I don't know. I'd never be looking over shoulder. Like, I don't think if I took them off after half time, it wouldn't really bother me. Like, that's the decision they think is going to have the team. That's the way it goes. Like, I think that was probably the biggest thing this year that there was no individuals. It was literally, as a cliche, it is a team performance. And you just, if Darren didn't play with the first half, Matty did or someone else did. And then Darren yeah. came on the second half. It was just, we didn't, we didn't rely solely on any one player, really, in any game. It was, as you could see that it sounds a, a team a team performance like I think there was one game or three quarterbacks or three full back lane scored a point each like it's just early game yeah. madness yeah. like uh, it was just it was just team and then the all boys come off the bench just finish it off like you mentioned it sorry Andy you jump in there go on oh, you wouldn't mind if them three full backs scored tap overs but I think one was outside the right one, <laughs> one was with the left foot on the run oh. and then the Kernans was a bomb as well so you no. You played with a load of those lads. I know you played three years of minor football with Throne, or you were on the panel mm-hmm. certainly for three years, and you would have been in and around um, Fergal Logan and Brian Dewar's first stint at 21s for a wee bit. I think Mickey Hart called you up when you were quite young into the senior panel, and we might come back to that in a wee while. I know the AFL clubs were sniffing around at that time. You mentioned the change in, in football, um, moving from maybe a defensive game to maybe coming full circle by the time you came back home. Did you notice a change in the skill levels of the Throne Boys, or did you? What kind of struck you the different, like the difference in your teammates? I suppose, like lads you would have known when you were sixteen and played football with. Like we've we've learned a wee bit about the story of Niall Morgan and Connor Myler and Kieran McGeary and a few others over the last couple of months. Con McShane is somebody we've come to know over the last couple of years. Was there? What was the biggest difference for you when you came home and you were in the dressing room? Probably the physicality of them like I suppose I when I left the studio there was, not, there was no such thing as gym but when I was 18 still not a big fan of gym but back then never used it like and then went to the studio obviously was put through a gym program on a daily basis so I came back sort of bolt up a bit and then come back to this chain and see them boys like Gaelic football is as professional as you get without the name it's the commitment the work them boys do is unbelievable like like even this year, we only, we only try to train three nights a week, but them boys for most years probably are training five, six nights a week, which is honestly something I don't agree with, but that's just the way Gaelic football has gone. And them boys, it's just the size and the fitness of them. The fitness still, they got Conor Miniman and Kieran McGee, why would run for days, like, and just, they just don't stop. Like, it's, it's just endless. Fired looking at them. Oh, it's it's unbelievable. Just, I think, how professional Gaelic football is, and by the recognition probably some players don't get, it's just, the work them by spending behind closed doors is unbelievable. And that's in every county, not just Toronto. Did you, did you, in terms of, and again, just using my knowledge, I suppose, of Keane coming back from Brisbane at the time, like his skill level when he came back, with not maybe not on the foot originally, yeah. handball and his left and right, his fist passing is just incredible. Did you bring 
I could notice it in you, even the way you hand pass the ball, the way you can move the ball quickly off both hands, your hand pass obviously in the final. Did you bring any of that to the to the Tyrone setup then when you came back? Yeah, so actually I brought a bit to my club and then we call it crowd, just the craft in Australia. So I did a bit with the boys this year, throne boys, and then probably myself, Connor Myler and Kieran Geary would do a bit every couple of weeks or before trading. It was just sort of simple hand pass or simple games with either two balls or three balls and we did a couple of group sessions where I sort of just took boys through a couple of more or less quick reaction drills. So it's something I think can be probably it's the next step we get to fucking go to is just getting that into club level. It's such an easy thing. We used to have rebound nets all over the club where you just hit a ball or two balls and you get two or three boys and you're throwing balls off and that and just catching and releasing as quick as you can. It's and it's the it's the wind of a game. Like it's might you might make a fumble in the corner back line and no one relays it, but if you don't make that fumble, that ball can get up to the full forward line maybe three or four seconds quicker and it can be in the back of the net. And it, it just small things can make a massive difference. And it, it was something I was trying to get into the team this year. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's deadly when you see it, and it's I, I think it's definitely somewhere where we can we can bring the game in terms of Gaelic football. I know everyone you hear the older fellas saying, "Oh, it's about foot pass and stuff like yeah. that." A quick release of a hand pass allows you up the field to get the kick pass yeah. up. Connor, um, you mentioned we were talking briefly about Mickey Hart there for a wee while. Mickey Hart was obviously manager for the six years that you were gone. Um, and I, I have a kind of a, a longish kind of question here for you. From from Connor <laughs> Moyler, they're all long. They're all yeah. long at the minute. From listening to Connor <laughs> Moyler, um, when he was on with us and seeing it, I suppose his father's LinkedIn post, Shawnee Myler, he put up a post uh, and you saw a photo of Connor as a kid in Crow Park. I think it was 03 maybe, or, or maybe it was 05. I think that could have been the first Southern final you were at as well. Um, like Connor's dad played with Tyrone, a family steeped in football. Uh, am I right in saying that it'd be your mom's side of the family that'd be the football side? Yeah, I will. Yeah. Dad sort of half kid was a but mum was a, uh... Supposing you're a very good camogie player, she played all her camogie for Tyrone and Aglis and got till maybe one or two Ireland finals with Tyrone, so it all comes from that side. But Dad has cousins, Grimley's, so Paul Grimley that used to manage oh, yeah. Ma would be like a far, far relationship to him, so he's trying to claim away with it, but yeah, it'd be all mum's side. Where, where did your drive come? Because like, you spoke about it quite a bit when you were in Australia, that you wanted to come home and you wanted to win in All-Ireland. Like, where did that drive, what was driving you towards that? Was it your teammates that you made, because I know you came to Gaelic football quite late. A lot of people mightn't realise this, but you wanted to be a jockey when you were 13 years old. I did, yeah. I quit football for a year when I was, Jesus, 13 or 14 now. So I went to a couple of stable yards and rode out most mornings and then tried to be a jockey. But I was... A tough bit, life. That's a tough, a tough life. life. A bit heavy, about 13 years of age. I was pretty happy for it. So <laughs> that <laughs> took a... World's biggest jockey. Like. That took a downfall, yeah, very quickly. But it honestly is still my first love. Like, it's, I would put it ahead of Gaelic football and really? most other things. Oh, it's, I bought two horses and I trained them. Sort of me and my dad trained them and dad's a license. So just looking off them, but that was my first love. And then sort of... That's a sort of weird one because I never really loved playing Gaelic football when I was younger. And then sort of the minors was one of the probably most enjoyable years I had getting to the final. It was just a great group of lads and the crack we had that year was unbelievable. And then I went to Australia and seeing the under-21 boys win all Ireland when I was in Australia probably was one thing that I sort of felt sort of sick about it and it was probably when I realised I actually do want to, to win all Ireland. So that sort of hit home with me and then I went to the Ireland final in 2018 and the first 20 minutes were in thrown went probably 5-2 five five up or 5-3 up. I thought it was going to be sick like it was just hard to watch. So it sort of it hit home then that we were getting sick at that stage as well. Oh, Jesus. It was, it was like, I want, I want to obviously want to be part of it. So, yeah, that was really the probably, but it wasn't, it wasn't really, it was younger. It wasn't really anything. I really, you caught a, you caught a bug. It's funny because if anyone was listening to last week's episode, they would have heard Paddy talking about being dropped in 2011 from, from Dublin. He was 22. He'd been on the panel for four years and, uh, he told us he was in tears in his, uh, or crying in his, in his parents' house watching the All Ireland final in 2011 on his own. And, he had missed it. So I suppose without jumping to conclusions here, boys, you seem to get caught by the same bug of trying to write the write it, you know. It's slightly different with me. I was dropped because I was going on the piss. Connor, <laughs> Connor, wasn't, Connor wasn't there because he was a professional athlete. So it's uh, I like the way you've tried to look. So I'll take that. I'll take that. You were going to join a monarch. <laughs> yeah, and then I tried to join soccer as well. Then yeah. 
Come here, Connor. Anna, I'm in, in, intrigued, right? The whole Aussie rules on the race thing it was quite big when, when we'd obviously care and Kenny went from our, yeah. from, our, from our county and then came back. Andy's obviously, had, I would have known Pierce Handley as well. When it happens, it seems to be this amazing opportunity. And it is an amazing opportunity, but, but guys are going over quite, quite young. It's a massive, massive change for someone that, that mentally you're still a kid. Like, like going away from home, how big a decision for you was, how easy a decision for you was that? Maybe if you weren't as invested in GAA at the time, was it an easy decision to say, right, I'm going to give this a go for two or three years, move to the other side of the world at 18? What was that? How, ba- how big a decision was that for you? To be honest, it was an, it was an easy decision because when I got, I'll never forget to get the first phone call. I think Tag and I rang me one day, I was in school and I remember coming home and we were all sitting in the living room and my mum came walking in and, I tell her I was going to Australia and that was just a shock to her. Like she couldn't believe it and probably thought it was a joke. But within the space of six months, I hadn't moved. Like, but when I got the opportunity to be a professional athlete, in my eyes, I was thinking I can I can never turn this down. Like I have to take the opportunity. And to be at that stage, I was playing, I was in the true minor team, the other one team, the senior team, the school team, I was yeah. Agish on minors, on the ones. I was playing Gaelic football. I, I, I had my fill of it and uh, to be honest I was just sick of it I was just an element of burnout was there? I, I, it wasn't, I don't know if it was burnout or just oh, new lease of life go away and sort of focus on, on one one team like, like I'll never forget it because uh, we could be in the minors by Manning and I'll never forget it and the next day I booked a flight with me and four mates to go to Ibiza nice. and Mickey Hart rang me and goes I want to come to the own team and I said I'm not actually sure if I want to come on and uh, I said I'll give you a ring in a couple of days and I uh, I hung up or whatever, I finished the call and I spoke to my mum and dad about it and I was like, I don't want to go because all in my head, all I wanted to do was go to Ibiza before I went to Australia because I hadn't been, I missed my lad's holiday the year before because of throwing getting to the Iron Final Miners. So I went back and talked to mum and at that stage, my two brothers were on it, the senior team as well. So mum said, it's the only probably opportunity you have to be on the same team as them. So Grant said, okay, reluctantly, I'll join the team. So went up to train. We didn't go to Ibiza. Oh, what? We didn't go to Ibiza. No, I did. I did. I did. Ah, yes, yeah, go on, so, man. So, went up and joined. We trained that week. I'll never forget it. At 18, all you want is the free gear. So, we 18, got the free gear on a Saturday. We played our man on the Sunday. We got bait in the championship on I feel Ibiza on the Monday with my five years. Are you and in the championship panel? Are you in the panel for that Armagh game? I wasn't the panel yet. What year was that? 2014. 14. 14, yeah. That's your big group, Paddy. Connor, enjoyed this past four times. I can remember just feeling sick that I wasn't going to get away. All I wanted to do, I, knew, I sort of knew at that stage I was going to Australia. I'd performed yeah. well in a couple of trials and tagged out and said, if you want to go, it's your opportunity, it's your choice now. And all I wanted to do was go on a holiday with five of my mates before I went to Australia. I didn't want to look at football. I didn't want to kick a football. And that, I, like, it sounds bad, but when they could bait, like, obviously, by Jeffrey, but I was over the, like, not over the moon, but I was like, I get to go and sort of do what I want to do now. And I came back from Baitha, and the day after a Baitha, I flew really went to the trials and well, probably didn't do as good as you should. But yeah. hey, hold on a second, you didn't do as good as you should. They Wait, were absolutely raving about you back in 2014 doing the trials. I thought you were an athletic freak. That was the trials in Ireland, and then I went ah. to the trials in Australia and <laughs> dipped off a bit. Sunburnt and hung out. And sunburnt, yeah. So it wasn't as <laughs> good then, but I just, I was just at that stage, I was just sick. Not sick of Gila football, just, yeah. I just honestly wanted to try something different. I was playing seven teams out of the year. I, I was just. Ready for a new lease of life. It yeah. was crazy. It was crazy around that time. I think I think it's gotten a wee bit better. I think it's gotten a wee bit better of you know talented underage players being dragged from pillar to post to different teams. The, the, the problem is a lot of times it's not actually the I don't I would happily play for six teams, but it's the managers want you to have everyone in the sessions. If the managers could come to agreement that you go to a certain session and play a certain game, everybody wants you at every time they need you, which it's, it's just not possible. You can't be in five places at once. No. No. Where kind of the, on the other side of it then so you, you were happy it was an easy decision to go you were mad keen to go how big a decision was it to to wrap it up and come home what was it was it that 2018 trip was it that the guys winning the 21 All-Ireland where you just said 
you know, what was their homesickness, I believe, at times, it's a massive change. What was the, what was the straw that broke the camel's back and said, Well, to bad side, after it be the easy decision to go out, about two months in, I was homesick, I was crying, was half asleep, I just hated, like, to be honest, like, so it did probably a full circle in the space of two months. I went out, big lad of 18, couldn't meet the British city, and about three months later, I was crying and mum sleep, like, just ready to come home. So I was always dealt with homesickness, just... I don't know, I'm from a small town here, like my, where I live here is literally a lane of cousins, uncle, auntie, uncle, auntie, granny, it's just my family, so to go to a city and I was put into a host family and they were lovely, get on and we still talk to them today and they talk to my mum and they might talk to them every couple of weeks, but it was just a different, a different vibe and mm-hmm. just something I never, I never feel love at, but it was that, I always knew, I was said to myself, I don't want to leave until I play at least one game of AFL, so I persisted the first year, played a game, Played two games the first year, and then you sort of get you get an incentive for playing a game. You get them actual money. So at that stage, I was like, "Fuck right, I won't try this again." So when I the next year, and I'll never get it. Every time I've got slacked to play a game, I'll just send my mum a wee money bag uh, emoji, and that meant I was playing the next game. Like, because in my head, I was playing a game, but to play the next game was going what more money. That's really that's honestly that's what we get. Broken like just, a true professional athlete. That's, it, that's it was like it was. And come here, just, you, you, the but, debut in the MCG, you score a goal with your first touch. Like, there must have been a buzz with that. Uh, it was class. Like, it, it was the like, to go out there and then to make your debut was unbelievable. I scored a goal with my first touch, and I think the second one, I want to catch it, and it just slipped through my hands and caught my square in the face. So it went from <laughs> here to zero. But no, nah, it was it was unbelievable experience. And even throughout the years playing, and I, 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 what I sort of love of there, the put you to the bottom of the bar, and like, I've said this a few times, I think, but. I mm. love just trying to work my way up and probably a few ceiling people don't believe Irish players should be there. They just think it's a Australian sport. Blah, blah, blah. So I sort of love to probably prove people wrong and put a target on someone's back and get better than them and then we'll get better than them. Just we next one. That was sort of my, my goal and I probably got to be playing consistent football and being a good AFL player probably my fourth and fifth year. And honestly, after that, I just sort of fell out of love with it as Paddy was talking about earlier on. I just... I just had to stop wanting to play really. And last year, COVID probably didn't have the whole thing. I was sort well, of moved moved away, and I just I just wasn't enjoying it. Like just just kind of your stats out there. I think we can't just no. Before you come home, we have to mention your stats. Your stats are ridiculous. Um, like you're one, you're robust. There's no doubt about it. So you played your first season only two games or whatever, but then you played seventy nine games, which is just over that short period of time is incredible. And you scored 19 goals, which is, what, a goal every four games, which is incredible, like, you know. So I think you're saying you're a decent AFL player is insane. I would have massive respect just for anyone that goes out. And, like, I'd have no, like, the money emoji thing, I think, is brilliant because if you were going out working and you were making money, everyone would say, oh, isn't he a great lad? Go down and just because you play a professional sport, you're going out create a career at 18 years of age coming back at 25, I think it's incredible. I've seen the same with Pearson, who's out at 17, 18 years of age, homesick, but just churned it away and churned it away and made a career and did really, really well for himself. So I think I, I think it's incredible. Then the coming home thing, going into the the, the paddy side of it, um, like the, the club Tyrone help you in any way? I don't need to know the details. I'm not asking you for the details, if they had to, but did they... Like, did they make the transition easy? Because I know that the, you get a lot, like when you're in Australia, you have player welfare officers, you have people you can go and talk to, psychologists. Like, it's not it's not an easy transition from home from Melbourne to being in the countryside in Tyrone again, you know. There's, yeah. there's changes that has to be made there. And did they, did they help you out with that? To be honest, not really. I suppose I made the decision to retire and I was talking to Mickey Hart throughout my years. But I'd say you were talking to Mickey last... Hart for six years. I'd say Mickey was on to you the whole that, time. To be honest, I've never spoke to Mickey probably until my last year. Really? That was it. But I came home. I came home twice in my last year. I came home once because I was homesick. And I flew back out after three weeks. Then I came home the last time and that was it. But not really. But Mickey sort of talked about it, but it nothing really came to tuition. Like I, I sort of, Fergal, before this year, Fergal Logan helped me and sort of got me a, a job more or less with a, a company called Matro in, in Cookstown. John Coyle, he's a massive showman. He looked after him all year and there's an odd company, a Shield, that gave him a QR sort of to help me this year. So stuff they got, but it was probably more Fergal Logan this year sort of put that into towards. I don't, I, I don't, I'd probably say that's what I like doing is going and expecting people to give him a job just because of their football. Like it's not, 
what I want to do, but I definitely have this year. I could sort of put more, more focus in the, the football. And the reason I the reason I asked that is because you're you're one of the the freakish few, the Marty Clarks, the Ty Canellis, these guys that have actually came home after spending a sustained period of time over there and came they came over with Paddy Brophy, I think, and if Kieran Sheehan who came home, if Kieran Burner came home, Keen Handley who came home, all these guys that came home and they've struggled, Killian McDade from Galway, they've they struggled to stay in panels, you know. So I've often wondered, could we as as, as Joe, as county players and county teams, help these guys, these outstanding young players to come home and actually fit in a tiny bit more. That, that, that's kind of where my question was leading more so than that. That probably wouldn't make it easier or give players a, a decision to come home. I never really got any, obviously, nothing not talked about, so I sort of just had to be a decision myself to come home. But it is a bit daunting, I suppose, to come home and not have a job, really. I'm lucky my dad has his own business, so I knew he could that, but it's not something I really want to do. He's an engineer, but... I went sort of in that three or four days a week just to get my bye, but it probably is a bit daunting and probably, to be honest, it's still something I haven't fully figured out. I'm sort of working my horses now just a minute and uh, maybe looking at opening a cafe and sort of stuff like that, but it's, it is probably a bit daunting that you can go from probably a decent salary to come home and have, have nothing really, because you obviously you have no degree or nothing, so you're sort of stuck in the middle. I have this vision of the you guys coming home and working in the cool camps. Do you know, that's, <laughs> you know that's, that's, that's what I do, do, you know, and it's just, I think we could do it an awful lot better, do you know? Yeah. Did, uh, did the big man, McShane, burn your ear when he was, uh, when there was talk of him going over? Okay, I did contact him a few times to uh, just sort of ask him about it because every, uh, what I said to him was more like, everybody thinks that you go to AFL, you come back into two years, you're a millionaire. It's not the case. <laughs> By far, it's the case. Like, it's, it's a decent wage, but at 18, like if someone said to me that you said, I got I think, the standard contract of theirs, $80,000 for your first year, which it sounds amazing, but in Australia, it's it's nothing. Like you, you, your tax is 35 up to 50% sometimes, and you're paying 25000 probably a year to live over there. Like, so it's your money, and then you come home for six weeks and you go to Belfast and drink in university, your money quickly goes, let me tell you. It you doesn't last that long. It does not last that long. Like it's, it's not the lifestyle. If you're going for a short stint, it's not going to make you money. If you go for ten years, like Zach Tui and Pierce Stanley, you probably can't make a, a good living out of it. But if you're going to go two years, come back and build a house for free, it's it's far from it. Like, can we can we talk just a little bit more about Australia? Because I am intrigued about that. You like you spoke. I, I mentioned the quote that you don't play a game without taking a risk. How long until, like, and I heard you before, uh, you were on another podcast speaking about putting targets on boys' backs and small wins. When you when you went over to Australia, you went from being somebody who was in a minor in a senior panel. So at your age, you were top of the country and you went to the roster then in Australia and without calling us, by calling a spade a spade, like you were bottom of the pick, like you were at the bottom of the rung and you built your way up from there. How long did it take you till you were selling solo dummies in the MCG or... Do you know, uh, like when, when, how long did it take you to get to that stage when you were kicking ball, not just punting it straight on, you were kicking ball with the instep and the outstep over there? I don't know, like it's probably took me a good, did the bite you a good two to three years to get that probably confident. And I suppose your first year you're trying to do nothing wrong, which is probably something that looking back on now, I probably shouldn't have did. But you come into the roster, and as you say, and Tag and was very clear, he goes, You're coming over here, and they will put you straight to the bottom. And if it's the last player to play picking a team and it's been new one off player and he's a student in your arse, they're going to pick the student. So you have to be 10% better than anybody else really your first two years because you're not going to get a chance. If it's a between you and Australian, the Australian's getting the, the go ahead like so probably did take me a good two, two and a half years, three years to really get settled in. And you do, you need a, my first year I sort of thought I should have played earlier, but the manager at the time I just, at this point, I'm wrong to say, I didn't believe he was going to play him at any stage. Then when he got the sack that year, I played the week after, so I sort of felt that was right. But, uh, and then the year after, a manager changed. And you, you need a manager that believes in you. Like, uh, even Irish boys and I go over there and they play two games, they get dropped, they play two games, they get dropped. It's not, for as an Irish player, you sort of need, and this is my, my manager goes to me, I'm going to give you five games, you're going to play every game. And the first game, of course, I got suspended, so I missed the next one, but... I played the next four and it just gave you confidence that you, know, you can sort of try stuff knowing you're not going to get dropped for, for doing something where some Irish players over there go there and they, they just struggle to get into the rhythm of it whereas I just got a free reign more or less to go you have five weeks here to sort of show what you can do and 
I never at the start like the the fans were ripping apart because I was shite. I was doing stupid stuff. That that and within six weeks, well, Jesus, brilliant! He can do this. He can do that. It's, it's unbelievable how quickly it can turn. Like, but that was my next question. Like, what was the connection like with the Essendon fans? Good and bad. Like, I suppose yeah. it's <laughs> any like any sport. Like, it's, the boys know. Like, you, you play a good game, you're you're the best in the world to do anything for you in the next the next week. It's it's based on week to basis. You play bad on a Saturday. For that week, you are the worst person in the world. And if you come around the next week and score five goals, you are the best player in the world. They, you don't do anything for you. It's just the way the way it goes. And F, in Melbourne, FL was just mad. It was it was the the big one over there. So you had fans that just lived for it and lived and breathed. It. And you sort of you could just see their emotion. Like if, if stuff was going bad, you're walking in the tunnel sometimes, you getting cursed at and told where to go. And I got told many times to go back home to Ireland, but I sort of chose my own time. Connor, that that first year you're saying we you, you do go over for being, and you know, to be fair to Ty, he sounds like he he wasn't telling you porkies. He was going yeah. to say, look, you're going to be up against it here as, as brilliant as a player as you were in Ireland, like as Tommy saying being top of the pops. You arrive over to Australia and you're up against it. Like how how frustrating is that first year, or is it you kind of expect? Listen, this is this is a learning experience. Where there, at times, even in the first couple of months, we're going. Like apart from the homesickness, just the actual sports piece, we go, I've made the wrong call here. This maybe uh, isn't for me. Or did you have a good sound the board in the club as well that was kind of giving you that bit of confidence or, or just telling you to keep at it? A lot of, not, I don't think I'd ever that point where the first year I thought, I want to go home right now, but a lot of frustration has sort of pulled me and another fella out of a lot of drills. So I spent probably my first three or four months just watching people training and doing, joining Probably honestly, probably because of when I went in the drills, I ruined them because I either messed up a kick or went to the wrong position, but that was just solely out of not knowing the game or knowing the skills. So I spent a lot of time sort of watching and they kept saying to me, Oh, we're just managing your load, which in Ireland is unheard of, obviously, at that age. So I was going, I am fit to do more than most players here, probably because in Ireland they're just running into the ground. <laughs> so it was something that really frustrated me. Like they kept pulling me out of drills and pulling me out, and I was going, please just let mad, let mad, let mad it. But no, there was no sense of I want to go home. It was just, it was, it was, I'm learning. Like, I knew, like, most boys are very good at it. There's a few players that, honestly, you, first day if I had heard I'm fucked up a kick, they were calling me stupid, like, as if I played AFL my whole life. But the majority of players were understanding, like, the new, for at least a year, I was going to be really, it was going to be shit. Like, that was the truth of it. Yeah. I, <clears throat> I think I've, un, I've often underestimated that because you do hear it that it's tough. Like, and I know, I know you've spoken a lot about being homesick before, but it's very hard to fully comprehend how difficult it is being away at the other side of the world. And I suppose that going on that like that, that's like, that must've given you a serious bit of drive as well to go and turn around and put in like 79 appearances. Andy said it like your stats in the AFL are sensational. Like really like, um, I don't know if, you, if you've seen this quote, but Dan Richardson, former general manager at Eston. I don't know if you'd agree with this now or, or whether it echoes kind of similar to what you said or at the start of the podcast. You haven't played your best stuff yet, but um, Richardson said that uh, in terms of your potential, from what I could tell, Connor wasn't going to fulfill his absolute potential in the headspace that he was in with us over in Essendon. He has huge sporting potential. It doesn't have to be in the AFL. Whatever his potential, he is so much more likely to fulfill it by being at home. Is, is that true? Is that fair? I don't know. I probably I would have said yes before I came home, but uh, I just I'm probably unsure now. Like I, I suppose I could talk about early on. Like I get like football for years. I've been five, six days away training for county. To be honest, if that ever go back to that, I don't know if I'd commit to that. I just I don't feel get footballs not that's not that important to me, but. There's so much more stuff I want to do in my life rather than just give six nights a week of football. I, I just don't agree with it. I think it's ridiculous to be honest. I think three, if we prove it this year that we train three nights a week, I will run all Ireland. And, and I think it's probably where the GPA can be better. I think the FLPA in Australia, they had limits on what we could do training wise. You have to be out of a club, but it's obviously different where we're professional. But at the club, we can do two, three full days and two half days. So we had to be out of a club on a half day at a certain time. So they can't keep your fracture. And I think it's somewhere where the GPA could probably say you can only train three nights a week, four nights a week max. That like at the end of the day, it looks great, but it, it doesn't build your house, it doesn't pay the bills, 
like you have a life to live, so you have to you have to put that first. And I love playing like football, but it'll never be number one at home in my life, to be honest. So you mightn't have been that drunk when you tweeted any clubs in the AFL <laughs> looking. <laughs> I don't know if that was me if I was a player. I was drunk. It could have been anyone. It could have been me. <laughs> Look at this. Pass the book there. Like. Oh, Jesus. I, 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 I'd say it was me, like, but sure. That's better crack. Ah, sure, a bit of crack is right. I think uh, the Tyrone boys were tagging Andy Moore in a few bits as well. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, gee, I woke up the next day and I didn't, my phone was bounced. I thought they're either very good or very bad. And you know, good laugh, didn't I? I think that perspective, uh, Tommy, is, is awful. That's incredible. Yeah. It's, it's awful important to kind of see it from the other side. Like we, like hillbillies like me, have been, have been entrenched in JA since I've been what age, you know, and you don't see the other side of where Connors went away there. He's seen another side to life. And sport and football and Joe, you know, they're, they're, they're getting paid for doing their job and playing sport. You know, so I think that's an amazing kind of outlook on it. And I think it's uh, it, it's very different than what we've been promoting over the last couple of weeks. But you know, it's just, it's just the way I guess most Gaelic football has been for so many years, and it's just expected of the next generation to do what the previous generation has done and mm. devote them five or six nights a week of football. Like even even these the drink bond thing, I just I just don't understand it. Like in Australia. To be honest, we drank on a, a nearly mostly after every game or every second game. The boys got the game and I had a few pints. It was it was nearly not forced, but it was told go out to build that camaraderie and not approach me that right. But it was like it, do that and be getting paid for it. I'm a professional sport and go out and every second weekend have a few pints with your mates. And then here it's like here there's three months during the summer you can't drink. It's it's going to affect you in three months. It's it's just stupid deal. like and it's just that it's until that next generation changes it which hopefully it's this generation the next generation won't won't change anything so it, ha- it has to evolve at some stage it's just it's just stuck in the past and you like sometimes like but it, it, it lads we touched on it earlier on this year you can see it the players are walking away and not just from you know, ga can have their head in the head in the sand about this and just say oh well he's walking away because they're maybe it's a, it's a perceived weaker county and they're not going to win the All-Ireland and, and I've had this conversation so much this season with two of our two of Dublin's probably most talented players Jack McCaffrey and Paul Mannion in their prime essentially have said they don't want to play like and people are going that's crazy how could they walk away from that Dublin team and, and I tell you the two lads would look at them and go you're crazy thinking I'll go back <laughs> in that cell because it is. It, it, it is all encompassing, and we we we've touched on this, Andy. And I think that the modern, younger generation of players, and like for, for my generation, and Andy, I never seen it as a sacrifice, and we touched on that. But it was. It was full on. But that was the price you we were willing to pay to, to, to try and win the All Ireland. I think younger players and modern players, particularly with the the, the development of other sports, soccer, rugby, traveling, social life, COVID. Was like an eye opener for a lot of oh, players to see. Well, wow, this is what a summer off is like. I can go and hang around with my mates when look when lockdown allowed and all like, like that. I don't think younger players are going to look at that and go, well, "I'm going to play for 15 years." I don't think you're going to see those careers anymore. I think guys will do it and go, "Give me four or five years, I'll give everything I've got." But then life gets in the way. I'm going. I'm going to travel. I'm going to study. I'm going to go off with my missus. I'm going to do whatever it is. I think it's going to become more and more prevalent unless. And as Connor, you've hit the nail on the head. The GPA need to look into this. How can we make it? You can still perform at an incredibly high level. You can still physically be in phenomenal shape whilst having life and other interests outside of it. And the draconian way that the GA operated in the past and this traditional sense of just everything else stops. You're an inter-county player. I don't think that's going to wash what modern players and what younger players coming through. So it's very, Connor. Totally agree, and great to hear you say it as well. You know? It's the same at our club now. To be fair, thrown for the first year in a long time, we changed senior games to a Friday night. But now that the bad weather obviously come in the darker nights, we have nine or seven league games left to play on a Sunday. Our last league game is fixed for the nineteenth of December, and then I'm straight back in the throne. Like it's <laughs> all like, Sundays. It's all every Sunday. Like I'm not going to give up the my next nine weeks to play a, a Gaelic game on a Sunday, it, just, it makes no sense to me. Like, why they can't change a match or every second match on a Saturday evening. Yeah. It's it's just, it's pure tradition in Toronto that every game has to be on a Sunday. And at four o'clock, there's places I travel on a Sunday at four o'clock and be an hour and a half away. Not back till half eight at night. It's it's just, it's just ridiculous. Like, it makes no sense to me how people can understand that 
boys want and I understand why young boys leave games now and don't come and leave during the year because they're expected to give up every weekend for the next four months and just play games. It, it's just it's not as on the our party touch there. It's not the next generation do not want to give that time to it. And fair play to the boys that did it in the previous years, but the next generation whether they have the tension span or don't have the worth active, they just don't want to do it and it has to change. That Sunday point, I'd say, would, would ring home to a lot of people around the country who play football, whether it's uh, camogie or, or, or fo- club oh. football or hurling or whatever it is. Derry, in fairness to Derry, they made the move this year to put all league games to a Friday night or a Saturday, I think. Uh, no more Sunday games. So I, I think if that if that's if that's one thing, like it's it's incredible. December 19th, you're able to look at that and say your next eight weekends, are <laughs> they want you to rule them out like it's... I don't know. Um, That's why you're retired, Paddy, from the club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nail on the head, man. No oh, time. Well, we got over to United every second weekend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, would you? Would you be canvassing Niall Morgan, your GPA rep, to have a chat about that? Might I? Might have yeah. to. Yeah. Um, like you talk about uh, not playing your best football yet. I suppose we were looking at McShane coming off the bench this year. We were looking at young Canavan coming on and another fellow who probably hasn't fulfilled his potential. By the time your all Ireland panel was named, like Richie Donnelly wasn't wasn't making it by that stage. The Brennans weren't um we didn't see much of Mark Bradley this year or, or Ron O'Neill. It's it's pretty scary like what, what Tyrone could achieve now that you've got that first All Ireland out of the way. And uh like Paddy mentioned it and Andy mentioned it during the year, the confidence you boys would have got after beating Donegal that we're motoring in the right direction here. There must be a bit of excitement about that as well. Or does that, do you even bother thinking about that yet? Oh, there is, the, yeah, there's obviously a bit of excitement. Like I think, especially this year, I think we hadn't beat Donegal for a while. And to be honest, beating Donegal nearly felt as good as beating Mayo in the final. It was like probably just a, a release that we hadn't beaten for years. And the beat in the first round or second round, sorry, was just sort of new or probably going well. And then morning game was sort of hung on and we probably just got through with the skin of our teeth. And then Kiai was again, big Kiai, we thought, Jesus, this is, we're going very well. And then probably beat Mayo. The, my two best feelings after the game this year was beating Donegal and beating Kiai by far. Like, I just felt like everything was against us. No one thought we would go in. Like, I think going to the Mayo game, we were, we were confident that we could beat them. And same as the Kiai game and just, I think that was just growing. Even going back to the, the four days after when we went out to Gan, drank in towns and the Tuesday and the Wednesday were just for our team. That's what the players talk about. We'll talk about for the next four years the stuff that happened behind closed doors that only us know and the crack that you had. And that will honestly build stuff for the next five years and bring lads. Like I hardly talked to a player in Eston until I went out in the beer room one night and probably made a fool of myself. But it just it just grows and just gives you something to talk about. Like it's it's unbelievable what it can do. Paddy, you had a couple of questions about that, but I don't know if McKenna's going to give that in the way to you. <laughs> He's on the record there. I won't put him under pressure. Now, it's just from our point of view, watching you guys, Connor, we said it. The, the Dunny, to be honest, the championship hadn't really kicked off by that point. And, and Tyrone and Donegal, everyone was looking at this. This is going to be, be the, the biggest game in the championship to date. And whoever won it, I, I felt Donegal had probably underachieved with Declan Bonner over the last number of years and it was a massive game for him and a massive game for them and obviously Murphy was injured coming into it and there was kind of touch and go and whoever won that game was going to catapult them forward in the season and whoever lost it was going to be a bit of a disaster really you know and that's what, what it turned out for Donegal there was a big inquest after but if you guys had been beaten then there's question marks over, over Fergal and Bryan their first year the league doesn't end well and then you lose, go out with a whimper against Dudley Gall. So it was, there was so much riding on that game and whoever won it, it was going to boost them forward. And when you guys came through, and I think the way you came through it as well, I, I know Dudley Gall without the 40 men, but you kind of, you ran them off the pitch, like really. You were just coming through in waves and it was like, I, I said, I actually got better in every game, but the confidence you got from that, and it's funny hearing you saying that, we kind of trick that that, that Dudley Galway was massive for you as a group and you just kind of go on strength for strength and good to hear good to hear we, we semi know what we're talking about Andy don't we yeah. no no it was it was huge and, like you're you're, you're about running through Connor comes on makes that unbelievable run I think McCurry kicks mm. it was, yeah. 
and it just kind of went on from there. And then I, I think the belief he probably took out of the Monaghan game too was huge. Frank Burns out, McGeary goes into centre back, does the job. You you kind of rotate with Mark Bradley in around the the third midfielder role. So I think all them things were just huge. And I think you probably went on. I, I I think the big question Paddy wants to ask is what like when you went to Coal Island with the cup. So you know, I think Paddy was uh, Paddy was on about he was on about speaking up to it. To be honest with you, <laughs> I surprised I surprised you didn't make it up. He meant every other part of the country. He went to Kerry, he went to Mayo, he went everywhere. He never first year retired, Connor, just making the most of it. Just yeah, get absolutely. Out there. But yeah. I'd say I'd say I'd say like something I never experienced. Paddy often kind of went through them. Uh, went, went through his days of the the hundred and five All Ireland's the one in a row, but. They, <laughs> Like, what, what, what was I'll it? Tell you what, Connor, when, we, when I won my first All Ireland, you wouldn't have got me playing matches for the next four months. <laughs> that definitely well, wasn't the case. Well, was it? What, were, were the sensational scenes? Was it? Was it? Was it like? Do you know the stuff that you dreamt about when you were up in when you were in Melbourne and you were over there and you win it? Like, was it all that? Was it all and more? Was it them? Them four or five days you were out? You were out here. Ah, tears! I they're, un- they're unbelievable. Like even. We had the banquet, but obviously because of uh, COVID, it was limited number. So it was just a uh, the player, the partner, and then uh, probably normally a mum and dad. So it was just a like a family event, and it was nearly better because it was just us. Definitely better. Oh, I ain't telling you. And we got a local bond in a bond called Two Degrees, coming and played with us. And gee, they played at six o'clock in the morning or something. And it was just the it was literally just about twenty boys in the middle of it, and it was it was just sing songs, and it was unbelievable. And then probably the. The Monday we went to a place in Mai, so I'm going to be our local, and we went to Ox Dreams and Tomney's, and we'd locked ourselves in the room in Tomney's, and we stayed there till whatever time. And it was just, it was just class, like you're sitting there singing with my boys, and you just, you couldn't be angry, like it was, it was unbelievable. You're sitting there to a surreal, just unbelievable feeling. What's your song? What's your song? What's your party song? Oh, their song, some song, Oompa, 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 I don't know, I missed it, it's, a, it's like four years ago, but I sort of just came in the end of it, so... <laughs> I just joined in running. Sounds good now, yeah. yeah. For all, any of the gigs we used to have when, when you won it, the, the night of the banquet is is mental. It's just it's packed. You don't actually get to really spend much time with with, with your teammates, mm-hmm. you know. And, and we, we were fortunate pre COVID, your family and, and and friends and stuff like that. You're kind of catching up with them the next day. Then there's kind of homecoming again with more fans. It's just mental. It's usually later in the week. Tuesday or Wednesday where you actually get to just sit down with the yeah. lads each time somewhere and you're having a bit of crack at what's happened over the last couple of days but it's the first time you probably get to sit down as a group since the final really and kind of go through it and that's the, the special times I think every GA team around the country can relate to that whether it's club or, or whatever when, when you get a couple of days out uh, afterwards so yeah well deserved Connor as well to be fair to you so yeah uh, Glad you've enjoyed it. Yeah. You're more months of enjoying it yet now, yeah. Connor, you've been brilliant with your time. Thanks a million for being the first guest this season on the football pod of Paddy and Andy. Um, I'm not going to ask you who you're playing next in the club, but I am going to ask you, uh, have we a horse to keep an eye on? We have a horse. We have a horse called Chaplin Knight. Uh, what is it? <laughs> say, say that again there. Play in. C-A-P-L-A Play in the Knight. And it's running next Friday night in a claim race. So if you want to bat... Eight thousand pound buys it. If you want to take it home, you can have it. For <laughs> sale. <laughs> um, oh, it. It's a travel pad. It's a horse race. <laughs> you can do whatever you want. Brilliant stuff, Connor McKenna. Thanks a million for joining us. No worries. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me. Congratulations on fulfilling the prophecy and winning that All Ireland medal. Cheers. Thank you. Right, lads. That was brilliant. Connor McKenna, our first guest this year in the football pod. Um, what a guy! Like, what a refreshing way to to look at football and. To not be phased by anything. I'll be honest with you, I, I probably had another 10 questions that I wanted to throw at him, but we couldn't keep him any longer. He was brilliant with his time. Um, yeah, really interesting stuff, wasn't it? i just fascinated by his personality. I think um, I, I just think it's so important for managers and coaches to go in and learn about people. And mm-hmm. for to get the best out of him, there's absolutely no way you can treat him like everybody else. There's absolutely no way. He's just a fascinating character. He's he knows his kind of he knows where he wants to get to. He knows what he's kind of good at at football. He still hasn't worked it out, but you know he's he's trying to get there. But his personality there, I just thought was fascinating. I love that intersection between being a professional athlete, coming home playing an amateur game, 
and knowing what he or listening to what he thinks is, is acceptable for amateur players to do. I, I just I found it like I can't wait to listen back to it to to hear just to listen to it again and, and, and see what you can the little nuggets you can take out of it. You know, from, from just chatting to him, I the the privilege of it, there was a couple of things he was saying and, and just his demeanor and, and kind of talking about taking risks, tre- his whole persona, his attitude. And I was just thinking, first, Dermot Connolly. That's what I was thinking straight away. Oh, yeah. I was like, I played with Dermot since we were <laughs> we were kids. And that's his attitude, like take risks, absolutely, completely unfazed, try something that doesn't come off, just total confidence and ability. And, and It rang a bell for you, did it? Oh, 100%. That's the way he was talking. The same attitude towards training as well. That's just stuck in my head, really. And um, he's right. And, and, and Andy's, Andy's spot on. There, there's players as, as a coach, and we've touched on this so many times, the genius, the most successful coaches, they know their players. They know their players. They know, yeah, certain players need leeway. And star players and X-Factor players. And that's... But Ferguson had it with Canton Adams. Yeah. Ball everyone else out of, but Eric and Lowell Hammer on the shoulder. And so some players, when they can make the difference, you have to do that with them. And but and it's so very similar to to, to what, what Dermot was like with us. Um, so yeah, very Clear, clearly though, when you hear him talking about bringing in the the little craft sessions into their own dressing room, like. He's, he's probably a bit outspoken, but he, he's a good influence as well. You can see that there. That, oh, yeah. And like, God, they can back him. Because no matter when it was in the game, if he kicked the wide or whatever, or it, like yeah, I think he missed a mark and kicked the wide before he, he made that match winning play at the end of the All-Ireland final. He backed himself and he delivered. And he he made the right calls. Um, yeah, well, fast, really interesting listening to that. Even the small thing about McCurry, he backed mm. the 45 and he used to hand the ball to McCurry. He actually used to have, like, I used to, I, I noticed that in the games that McKenna was always looking for McCurry. That little intersection, that little little snippet he gave us there, you can see why, because he, he, he backs him 100%, you know, and yeah, I, I just think, uh, like, what an addition to Tyrone, what an addition to, Joe, you know, what they're trying to put in there, how they're trying to get the best out of the team, how they're trying to learn from each other. But, but, it's funny, Tommy, we, we said it. And he thinks the, he's thinking the exact same as what we were saying. He's nearly frustrated with how he plays because he knows there's so much more there. And that's what me and Andy are saying. I know you've been bigging him up the whole time. And, and, and we're, yes, he's had some amazing moments, but we can see there's so much more there. And that's what I'm waiting for him. And Did you see his face when we said he was in our team of the year? <laughs> I he was right nearly, what it. is wrong with you? <laughs> no, but... but uh, I, th- I think the moment he has like so much he's talent and it's yeah. like and that's interesting about it. if you're Logan and Doher going through the next season you're mm. thinking where can we play him yeah because he's that good and he has the ability he, and like he's going to get better he, <laughs> he mightn't play many of these club matches but the more exposure he gets the better he's going to become because there's so much talent there if Tyrone can get him dominating games like what he's the potential look so we, you can see it, and he knows it himself. That he, it's funny him saying that himself that he, he knows there's so much more there as well. So, a really good guy, uh, very good with his time. And, and look, he's been a story of the championship, he's been an absolute story of the championship. Um, and then a key part for Toronto and over there. So, in, in the midst of or in the aftermath of your seven All Ireland titles, what was the shortest turnaround to a club championship game in Dublin? Six days, <laughs> try losing one. I'm playing six days later. Six days later. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, that, that's uh, the way that the, the club champs operate in Dublin is that they, they just stop it until the yeah until the inter-county team uh, ha, had finished that, and we were, look, we were very fortunate that, that January we were going until the end of September. I think it was 16 we drew Andy, and, and the the all the, final, the replay was in October, mm. so the club champs was put back, and we basically won, and that week. You're back playing with the club. You went, so. you, went, you went midweeks that time, didn't you? Yeah, Wednesday. Yeah. There was a Wednesday game. Literally, yeah. it might have been, might have been even less. We were sitting, team, some lads were playing four or five days later. Probably wasn't their uh, probably wasn't their best performance of the year playing that club game. No, so uh, yeah, it's the structures again, isn't it? I think that's it, lads, for episode twenty-two of the football pod. I think my maths are correct. Yeah, we're twenty-two episodes in. Thanks very much for listening in to everyone at home. Paddy Andrews, thank you for your time. 
No problem, lads. Andy, thank, thank you. Much. Thanks, lads. And uh, hit subscribe if you haven't already and, and share the podcast. Plenty to learn from Conor McKenna this week. And uh, we will let you know on our Twitter and Instagram pages whenever it's back up who we've got coming up next week on the Football Pod. Thank you. See you, lads. See you, guys.